Hi, and welcome into this Telstra virtual event. I'm Justin Cleveland. Today we're talking about education and primarily technology in education and how it's impacting the classroom, really changing the classroom. And while I've been an educator, I'm not an education expert. Instead, we brought in a panel of education experts to talk about this very topic, and hopefully we'll have some takeaways you can take back and implement immediately. But before we get into all that, I want to take you through the Telstra Virtual Events platform. Uh, primarily, you can, first of all, resize and move around the boxes as you need around your screen, just so it's a better experience for you. And along the bottom of your screen, you'll see some widgets. Uh, down in there is a resources tab. You can download a copy of today's presentation. Uh, you can download a copy of a video of a case study about the Deloitte example, and, uh, excuse me, the Delaney example. We'll take you through that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and also get copies uh, and, and information about David Price's book. Uh, and who is David Price? Well, <laughs> why don't we go ahead and introduce him right now. Uh, David Price, sitting to my immediate right, is a Senior Associate for Innovation Unit and an Education Expert. Welcome in, David. Thanks, Justin. Uh, also joining me here on the conversation today is... Greg Whitby. Greg Whitby from the... Uh, he's the Executive Director of Catholic Education in Parramatta. Uh, welcome in, Greg. Great. Thanks to me. Good to be here. Uh, on my left is Susie Stegler-Peters, the Education Industry Executive from Telstra. Welcome. Good morning. And also joining me is Elise uh, Velo. Did I get it close? Yes. <laughs> Elise Velo. I, I've butchered her name so many times today. <laughs> she keeps very politely correcting me. Uh, she is uh, the Manager of Design Research for Steelcase. Welcome in, Elise. Thank you. So with no further ado, let's jump into our topic here today. And for that, we turn to Susie Stegler-Peters. And Susie, uh, when people think Telstra, they may not, you know, they may think their phone company. They may think, uh, I mean, well, hopefully they're thinking about the cool things that we do. But ultimately, they may not think of it as an education-supporting institution. Mm -hmm. What is Telstra's role in education? Yeah, Telstra has always been heavily invested in education um, over many, many years. But in recent years, um, we've ramped up our commitment to education in in big ways. For example, uh, through um, more serious commitment to things like thought leadership, um, which sets policy direction, if you will, uh, by also investing more heavily in solution innovation, in working with schools to understand what are the issues and challenges and what are the opportunities where we can work together to actually help shape the future. So Te Telstra actually sees its role as a major enabler and a supporter of education. And we have great opportunities to be able to bring this forward, most definitely with uh, schools and universities and TAFEs and any education agencies in Australia who want to work with us. So we're open for the conversation. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I, I think there's a lot that we can talk about. Let's talk about technology in the classroom because it's, it's obviously something that's ubiquitous in the home. You know, our kids are better at using tablets than we are. Uh, they, they just have a natural, innate um, sense of how to use these things. And we as educators may not be picking this up necessarily. So how do you see the role of technology in education? Well, the role of technology in education cannot be dismissed anymore. It used to be many years ago. It used to be, you know, the lid was put on it. Don't bring your mobile. Don't turn it on. But now it's so pervasive in everyone's life that to actually shut it down when you enter the school gate is a nonsense. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, in most, most learning ecosystems, if you will, technology is there. Mm -hmm. The lights are on all the time. And if, if teachers aren't using it you know, um, uh, uh, as, as expected by, by learners, learners are going off and creating their own ecosystems, creating their own ways of integrating technology into practice. But I have to say, you, you know, over the last 18 months, there is very clear evidence there that teachers are reaching out and wanting to learn a couple of things about technology. How do I integrate it? Mm -hmm. But the question is more, you know, why should I integrate it and what kinds of technology and how do I know when it's effective? And they're the sorts of areas that we work with uh, schools and universities and TAFEs on to understand better what's appropriate rather than just going all guns blazing yeah. with technology for the sake of technology. Yeah, so we're going to get into this discussion in a bit more depth in just a couple of minutes. But first, I want to ask you in the audience essentially who you are. Uh, of course, this is an interactive conversation. We're going to be talking across each other here in studio, but we won't, uh, also want to hear from you. Uh, feel free to ask at any point questions via the question box that is on your screen. But also, I want to ask you a, a question right now so that we can better tailor our presentation uh, to you. Who are you in the audience? Are you an educator in the K-12 system? Are you an administrator, a manager? Do you work in IT in the K-12 system? Are you uh, an educator in higher education, uh, a manager in, in higher education? Or do you work in some other field uh, entirely? And this will help us just shape our conversation so we better know uh, the examples to use for you in the audience. So while those are populating, I'm going to introduce the gentleman to my right, and that is David Price. And David, you've, got, uh, you've written books on the subject, and uh, people turn to you when they're looking for information 
uh, about the transformation in education. So uh, tell us, what are you seeing globally? Well, I think you could kind of summarize the, the, the challenge has been primarily uh, that of teachers because the role of the teacher is uh, changing. It, it, it has to change. Um, in some ways, it's the kind of best of times and the worst mm. of times. It, teachers have to be, I believe, um, cognizant of the, the changes that are taking place now in the way that we work. Huge changes about to happen in terms of employment patterns, jobs that will be lost as a result of disintermediation or automation. Um, and teachers, we, we, we have to think about the long-term um, uh, impact of, of, the, of the teaching that we do now and the learning which takes place um, rather than the kind of short-term, uh, you know, three to four-year cycle that, frankly, politicians work on right. and that filters its way all down through the school system. So I think that's the challenge that they've got. The opportunity is that we've never before had the, 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 the ability to connect and learn from one another as educators to the point that now I think if you like, professional isolation is becoming more of a kind of choice than a circumstance. Yeah. So when you say professional isolation, you mean that people are stepping back from what's going on in technology uh, or, or what's well, changing? What, what, what I mean is that you, you have to opt out, I think, now, uh, mm -hmm. as an educator, rather than, you know, the, the, when we have the early adopters, you know, people who first went to the first teach meets and people who first got on Twitter, you know, that, that was a very small cohort of people. But now this stuff has become so ubiquitous that, you know, your closest collaborator could be on the other side of the world yeah. rather than the other side of the staff room. Yeah, and I know there, I mean, there have been forums used in education for years, I mean, I mean, dating back to the original message boards. It seems like educators want to find a way to be innovative, and they don't care where it's coming from, you know, whether you're across the hall or across the country or across the world. Absolutely, and so, the technology makes that possible. Yeah, so what are you seeing, I guess, trends that are, that are going to continue to shape this? And, you know, as we're jumping on board, the very nature of technology is that it's changing constantly. And uh, that can be very annoying as you're trying to develop a strategy and, and you know, make a, a good spend for your institution. Um, so you buy all of the latest and greatest and then it's out of date very yeah. quickly. So where do, what are you seeing coming next and what should we look for? Well, th this, is, this is where we get this um, double-edged sword, really, because the, the very technologies that are threatening the future job prospects of some of our kids, uh, that is robotics, artificial intelligence are the technologies that also hold the most uh, power in terms of how we might connect and share knowledge and information. I, I think this is pretty bewildering for most teachers because at first it feels like it's something else that you've got to do, it's an add-on, but I think we now have to recognize that we're, we're very soon getting to the point, I think, where to be an effective teacher, you've got to have a degree of technological literacy. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, uh, for some of us of a certain age, you just have to take that decision to jump in and find out how this stuff worked. And I always say to, to principals, you know, when they say, oh, you know, we don't really like our staff being on Twitter. And I say, well, have you ever used it? And, and once you start using this, because the argument I make in the book is that it's technology-led, a lot of these changes, but it's actually a, a, about people. Mm -hmm. And it's about connecting with people. It's, there's a huge sense of trust and generosity. We've now got a situation, uh, there's a project that I'm working on back in the UK, and we have teachers who are sharing videos of their lessons, the ones that didn't work, and they're putting them up online, and then they're being problem-solved by the colleagues from all around the world. At the same time, these are teachers who are feeling apprehensive about their line manager coming in to observe them teaching in a mm -hmm. class, but they're perfectly willing to share them across this community of, 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 of like-minded people. So that speaks, it seems to me, to, to the kind of sense of trust and generosity which these communities are starting to develop. So I think we've really got to tap into that and rethink the role of a teacher now because it, it is as much about the design of learning and the design of their own professional development rather than a kind of top-down model. This is how you do it. This is the professional development that we think is right for you. The, the irony that we've all got about informal learning is that by its very nature, it's really hard to manage. So therefore, there's a, there's, a, there's a responsibility on administrators to trust their people a lot more yeah. 
because we can do this now. We can, we can create our own professional development programs. We're talking about personalizing the learning for our kids, but actually there's as much personalization of our own professional learning mm. which needs to take place. And that presents challenges not just for teachers, but for administrators too. Yeah, so you talked about teachers primarily being the focus of the, of the technology, but I mean, how much is that the teacher being willing to adopt and how much of that is the administration maybe um, pushing edu or, or technology on them? I mean, what sort of balance do we have to be in to have a successful transition? Well, I think uh, f forever we, we will have new technologies uh, appear and new, new pieces of kit, new tools. Um, and I think one of the missing pieces is that often the technology companies will design something and think that this is going to solve a problem and then try to sell it to teachers, basically. What I think we need to now think about is how can technologists uh, and uh, you know, edu, edu tech companies work much more closely with teachers at the design stage so that these platforms are going to be useful for them and that they feel invested in it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not at that stage yet, but I think we're starting to... to, to we're, we've got the realization now that uh, if we're talking about what I call a global learning commons, um, it means that we need other than the conversation needs to be broadened beyond educators and we need to bring in these entrepreneurs social entrepreneurs edutech companies we need to bring them into the mix of the mm -hmm. conversation so let's jump into some of the challenges that you're seeing in the marketplace right now um, because ultimately the purpose of education is to get people the information that they need the skills develop the skills that they need to be successful as human beings and, and interacting in society um, but you're seeing sort of the way that that we get to that point change yeah and i i think we've gone beyond now this um kind of seduction with the technology um uh, and, and and we're all aware of what what how powerful this stuff is for ourselves one of the uh, incredible things it seems to me is that every time I'm with a bunch of educators, ask for a, uh, a head count on the number of people who've shared a, a piece of information socially or they've learned a piece of information in the last seven days, and it's usually about 100% of the audience. That's amazing when you think about it, that 10 years ago, that would have maybe been five or six people. But this stuff, is, it's a measure of how ubiquitous it's become, uh, how much it's just part of our daily lives now. And I think the, the irony is that what I see in the UK, which is you know, where I live and, and, and do a lot of my work, is that we're still at the point that, that Susie described earlier, where we're trying to block this stuff. Uh, and that seems to me to be incredible, because if we, if we don't, there's going to be a, a division between the learning which takes place in our kids' lives out of school mm -hmm. and what happens in school. And it's going to feel awfully dull mm -hmm. in comparison when they're in school. So I think as educators, however, many concerns we've got and of course there are real concerns about safety and how we use this stuff um, we've got to we've got to get over that and we've got to think about how it can be integrated how their own devices that they're using can be integrated but also we've got to be aware of the learning that they're doing uh, outside of school uh, to give you a little story when my uh, eldest son was 15 uh, I was having a real job getting him out of uh, uh, bed in the morning nothing unusual about that I suppose in <laughs> adolescent Except in his case, he was almost comatose. And I said, what is it, Jack? Why, why are you so tired? And he looked a bit sheepish, and he said to me, um, well, he said, I take part in internet uh, phone-in programs, uh, and at which point, as a parent, you know, you're immediately alarmed. And I said, well, what kind of internet chat shows? And he said, oh, it's about libertarian politics. And he said, because that's happening in America, in the UK, that's kind of, you know, three in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, can't you just record it and listen to it later? And he said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm a contributor. I don't just listen to it. Uh, they ask me, you know, what I think, just like we're doing today. And I thought, how cool is that? He's 15-year-old and he's taking part in these phone programs. Now, no one knew in his school that he had an interest in libertarian politics mm -hmm. or that indeed he had a lot to contribute. And I think this is the, 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 the warning for all of us really, that we need to make sure that there aren't two kinds of learning which are taking place. And we have to try to understand what our students are doing socially and how they're learning mm -hmm. because this stuff is really powerful. But it's not, I keep stressing, it's not so much about the technology, it's simply that the technology enables that learning to happen now beyond the school and we have to recognize that what goes on in school 
is a relatively small proportion mm -hmm. of the learning our kids are doing. Right. Well, the kids are interested in learning something, whatever that may be. And I think that's yeah. always been the case. You know, if you're interested in working on engines, you're going to go and, and, and work on engines in your spare time. Yep. But now that we have access to so much more, um, it's going to continue to be, I don't want to say it's an issue, because I don't think it's an issue. But we're going to have to deal better with technology. So let's talk about some of the, uh, the things that, because our students ultimately are going to be put out into a marketplace where jobs are going to be very different than what they are today. Um, and so what are the challenges that we're going to face in preparing them for the world of tomorrow? Well, uh, I, I mentioned automation before, and uh, you know, we are in a situation by uh, University of Oxford's just released a report which speculates that by 2030, which is when kids who are in kindergarten now are just finishing their, their high school career, so it's not that far away, but by then it's estimated that almost half of the jobs that currently exist now will be uh, done by robots or artificial intelligence or automated software. So, and, and those jobs are primarily knowledge jobs. This is the big shift, you know. It isn't just about robotics building cars now. It's about robotics carrying out uh, surgery. It's about, we're even starting to see it in the classroom. They're now piloting um, uh, a, a kind of Einstein robot in, in classrooms in Southern California. And kids are responding really well, it has to be said, to robotics. Um, we're actually seeing now autistic kids are, are saying that they prefer to be taught by a robot. Than, than a flesh and blood teacher. So there's a challenge there for us as teachers, you know, uh, uh, how many teachers are we going to have in 2030? How many teachers are we going to need? But that, that challenge runs right across the gamut of, of, of all kinds of occupations. Um, and I think now we have to really think seriously about what are the skills that our kids are going to need in this increasingly competitive workforce. Um, and frankly, they're not uh, generally speaking, the kind of skills that were um, urged by you know politicians um, to, to to look at in terms of PISA league tables, they're, they're going to be the kind of 21st century skills um, uh, that 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 we talk about, but that we need to develop as a right for these kids because mm -hmm. if we don't, we're not preparing them to be, uh, you know, dil d freelance mm -hmm. uh, ed uh, em employees. With the, it's estimated that we, within five years' time, we're going to have half of the workforce is going to be freelance. Now, how many politicians are talking about this kind of future? And how many educators are actually thinking about what this means in terms of the skills that we need to develop in our kids? If they've got to create their own work, that's a whole different uh, scenario from when I left school, there was pretty much full employment in the UK. It's, it, now you're probably going to have to create your own job, and that's mm -hmm. a very different scenario. Yeah, that's a, a bit of a scary thing. I yeah. want to jump back a oh, bit. Yeah, oh, please yeah, do. do. Um, we also see that work is becoming more complex and distributed, meaning that teams uh, prior, 15 years ago, may be uh, located in the same environment in the project room or at the office. But today, work is becoming more distributed, globally distributed. So students need to learn not only collaboration, but how to communicate with different cultures. Absolutely. So that, that, that has to do with communication and, and empathy. So today, education needs to teach not only you know, collaboration and advanced problem solving, but how to really connect with someone and get your point across. Because it's really about um, you know, innovation, in, and today companies are very concerned with getting their products and ideas to the market faster, really. Um, and w with that, you need to communicate your ideas um, with a range of different cultures, a range of different disciplines and departments quickly, um, and to solve those complex problems. And that's what employers today are, are actually expecting, and we need to teach that in the classroom. It's no longer just memorizing materials, but um, advanced problem solving, communication, collaboration, and really connecting with people. Yeah. And we tend, to, we tend to think of this as something which is maybe coming down the line, but it's actually here. It's today. You know, my youngest son works in IT. He works essentially from his bedroom, and he'll Skype the client in, uh, you know, New York that he's working for, and he'll then be managing a team of, uh, you know, people in India who are, mm. who are doing a lot of the work with him. And, you know, he's... He's, he's never been trained to do any of that. He's had to learn those kinds of communication skills, those cultural yes, skills that yes. you talked about. He's had to learn that for himself. But I think we'd be helping our kids if we were actually giving them those kinds of experiences when they're in school. Yeah, so we work with people now in, in, in a variety of different office environments, and yet for years we are just focused on keeping kids in a row with a desk and, and you know, fitting in there. Uh, so yeah, things are definitely going to change very, very quickly. So let's talk uh, a bit about the, um, the opportunities now that face us and some of the things that we can do to adapt. 
Yeah, well, as I said before, I think we've, we've, we've got this ability now to, to connect and problem solve with our colleagues. Typically, we've got a system which doesn't really allow for this. You know, mm -hmm. Greg can speak to this far better than I. Um, but we're, we're at a point, it seems to me, where if we don't release people to actually work with one another, to collaborate as, as educators, um, then we will essentially still have this privatized occupation. If you think about, you know, the typical model of a teacher, it's one person in a room with 30 kids and they never see another teacher. They might pass in the staff room, but actually we've got to think about how can we become much more collaborative in our own practices? Mm -hmm. How can we deprivatize the profession? Because if you look in the world beyond education, that's what people are doing all the time. You know Google's mantra about failing fast and iterating? Well, you can only do that in a collaborative working environment right. when you allow those kind of moments to happen. Mm -hmm. A question's come in from the audience from uh, Jason that kind of bounces off of this and you, you talked briefly about the political aspect of this and yes that's going to be a battle that has to be fought but is is there a limitation from politics right now for changing the way that we operate uh, because of day of care responsibilities and things like that you know that ultimately our, our, our kids need to be taken care of um, how do we balance that out with you know the need to give them the freedom to really learn? Yeah. yeah. Or, Greg, you, or, please. Yeah, you come in Greg. Uh, Jason, is it? Yes. Uh, ignore the politicians. They're irrelevant in the argument. Um, we'll never solve this politically because they're not focused on what the issues are. They're focused on an election cycle and they'll default to the lowest possible number, which is give me the solution. There is no silver, silver bullet for this and there's no quick fix. And I'm being intensely honest about that. What will happen and what will change is when we engage in things Dave has been talking about, teachers addressing this issue and changing what they're doing and changing their practice. So let's actually, I want to jump back into the teachers. Another question that came in a bit earlier that I think is now relevant is why would teachers participate in, in, in new technology as ways to collaborate when they've already got things that they're happy with and things that are established? And how do you convince someone who's, I don't want to say set in their ways, but how do you talk to them about you know, adopting these new technologies? Because this is the world that we're living in now. Uh, we. We expect our kids to be constant learners and relearning and unlearning all through their lives. So why should it be any different for us? <coughs> um, we, the, the technology moves on, the way in which we use it moves on, and we have to constantly be challenging ourselves as educators. Yeah. Uh, can I come in on that Please, as well? Please, absolutely. The other, the other factor in that is that it's really not a choice for teachers anymore to ignore the uptake of integrating technology into practice because if they continue to ignore it they'll continue to see uh, a, a, a rise in student disengagement. Mm. Students won't turn up, they won't participate, they'll turn to their own devices, they'll turn to one another, they'll want to collaborate as they mm. do in an outside of mm. classroom experience um, and consequently you know the whole notion of the value of the teacher, the, the value add of the teacher, mm -hmm. let alone of the the school environment or the the university environment comes under fire, comes into question. So it really is is important for teachers to, and and I actually would argue that most teachers are interested in knowing how to do the mm -hmm. job better. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And yeah, that actually yes. brings up a very good point. In fact, that's on our slide deck now, uh, and that is any teacher that can be replaced by a computer will be. Um, David? Yeah, and that was that was a quote from David Thornburg, and and you know I think we have to think about what is it, what is what is the changing role of a teacher, because we if 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 it's simply that you're the expert in that subject area, well that knowledge is out there. So you've got to think about what is it that you can do beyond that. And if we if we think about it, maybe in five to ten years' time we might not have a situation where kids need to be in school five days a week in front of a teacher you know because a lot of that information's out there when you've got places like MIT which has put all its kind of lectures mm -hmm. all of that stuff's online and I've signed and up for a lot of the available. Harvard yeah. EDX classes exactly. just because I want to learn yeah, yeah. exactly mm -hmm. so we have to work with that rather than pretend that it's not really happening and that's 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 going to be a, a, another challenge, but it's a, also it's a great opportunity because it could free up the kind of time that you know Greg was talking about that teachers will need for their own professional development. I think something else that's happening in the learning environment is that there's um, an increase in what we're calling learner agency, which is a fancy way of saying that <coughs> learners are more aware mm -hmm. of where they're at with their learning. They want to be more aware as well, and there's a direct corollary between that and how they operate in a social 
media mm -hmm. environment. They know where they stand. They know who they're influencing, who they're being influenced by, yep. and so on. So the same applies in a learning environment. So consequently, the next shift is, what does that mean for the teacher? The teacher has to have a better view of the student, where the student's yes. up to in their learning progression, if you like, the learning sequence, and what value add yeah. Yeah. is there, you know, um, what value add possibilities are there for them. So it's a case of working together in that environment. Now that speaks very much to things like personalising the learning yes. experience, and there's a huge expectation that that occurs. Now, um, and it's things like uh, technology tools that can assist there. Maybe it's not necessarily a mobile device because that's an access point, but it's things like learning analytics that we need to unpack better. What's the data that we can actually use to provide a better profile of you know, the learning progression of a student? Of, of, and, and it's not data that's used to look at someone else. It's data to understand you and yourself where you um, are situated in the learning experience. What's your profile? What's your sphere of influence, if you like? So it brings social media squarely into the learning ecosystem like never before. And it's different than having your grades posted on the door and you know being able to judge yourself just based no. solely on that. It's not about grades. Yeah. It's no. absolutely not about grades. It's it about you and how you engage, uh, what your passion is, and most definitely what um, you know your, your sphere of influence. Yeah. And the technology really allows the student to take control of their own learning, so it becomes more of a self-directed experience. Um, so they can have their own pace. So they, they can learn that you know technology can help with the feedback to yep. see how much content they can take in at a time. It also um, technology when it's integrated into an environment, it lowers lowers the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So no longer the teacher no longer the the teacher can stand in front of the classroom at, at a podium and, and lecture, but if technology is integrated uh, properly within a learning environment, um, that empowers the student, it democratizes um, the learning experience. Yeah, and as a, as a lecturer, that's, I mean, that's a very difficult position to be in because you can obviously tell the kids who are getting it, and you can obviously tell the kids who are struggling, but those ones in between and what you can do to support them sometimes when you're in that moment is very difficult. And if you don't, you know, uh, take the time, there's, there's just so many variables in the teaching there experience. There is, but when you observe a classroom, um, you see the different rhythm and flow. And you also see that students that are slightly ahead may also become the teacher to other students in the room that may need help. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, instructors and educators need to, you know, evaluate their role and become more of a mentor. Um, and give some of that power of, of learning to, back to the students. Yeah, which is a fascinating technological point. Um, at the risk of being controversial, um, I want to try and bust some myths here. Um, this is not about technology. This is about learning. And it's always been about learning. And to, uh, to address this issue with the supposition that somehow kids today are different, they are no different. You know, I think, don't think a refrigerator is technology. My father, who never had a refrigerator, always loved, told me how they did it tough. That was great technology. This is what they... We've got kids in schools who've never known a world without an iPhone, but we've got teachers who won't even touch it because they're frightened and it will bite them. So the issue is and has been and will always be about learning. So that's, that's the myth busting, first one. The second one is we actually know the answers. We, we actually know this. We know we've got good theory, we've got great learning theory, we've got great cognitive theory, we've got brain science, mm -hmm. the work going on in neuroplasticity, all informing teacher practice and we are very focused on evidence. So we do know the answer. The third thing is that the answer is not going to be found in tomorrow's schools. They're going to be found in what we do today. And the fourth myth is that who's going to do it? And this comes back to the question about the politicians. The politicians are going to do it, aren't going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I don't do any teaching. The people who are going to do it are our teachers. And it comes right back to uh, David's point. So they're the four myth busters. The issue is that schooling and learning is going this way, mm. right? And schools need to reclaim the territory. And while I accept what Elise was saying about the, the, teaching, the, uh, the student and the empowerment of teaching, it comes back to Susie's point. The empowerment is what good teachers do with kids. You can't take the teacher out of this framework because it's about teacher, student and content in a continuous dance mm -hmm. around how they do that. What we do have is great learning theory supported by great enablers. Let's think about it that way. And this focuses the discussion because we need to work with teachers on the theory and practice base. But we also need to understand that they are enablers and then how we get them into the space where they're comfortable and all that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm fairly controversial sometimes. I say to any of our teachers and our leaders I work with, if you are not using social media, you will be professionally irrelevant. And they don't like that. 
It's, uh, but Be, it's a hard but, fact of reality for uh, pretty much uh, any job. It is, job. because you're not in the, the, the real world. My business card has a, 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 a graphic, and my avatar is developed in Minecraft. I give it to some mm -hmm. of my professionals. They look at it and say, what's this weird, strange thing? So, you know, you've got to be there in the conversation because shaping that and finding the answer to the questions. I, the, the way, and I'm not just trivialising it or trying to say it's simple, but the paradigm now is the default position under the current model of schooling is I know how to do things before work with teacher, mm. yeah, this works for me, you know, don't worry about all that theory and practice. So we've got to say, well, we move from I know to we learn. Mm -hmm. That is a powerful way to do it. And what we're finding in the work we're doing, and you'll hear more about that later, of course, is that you can't do it by yourself. That's why we're engaged with people like Telstra and Steelcraft, Steelcase, who, um, who actually know what, what we're doing. And the, the Steelcase is a great example. When we're talking about teacher practice, we found a way to embed technology in the furniture. We'd right. never thought about that. Mm -hmm. right. So we didn't think about it, but we found this company had thought about it. And then Telstra says, well, we've got that and let's, let's connect that. And we found now that we've got teachers able to actually talk about their practice in real time yeah. and so learners in real time. That's a good uh, point. And actually, Greg, I want to jump yeah. into your examples in just a second here. Uh, but first, I want to ask you in the audience, um, what do you see as the top challenge in, in implementing basically what we're talking about here, which is 21st century teaching methods and, and um, uh, and technologies in your institution? Is it enabling anytime, anywhere learning? Uh, is it the digital literacy of teachers? Uh, is it the infrastructure challenge? Or is it the, implementing, uh, the implementation of education solutions uh, in pilot programs and things of that nature? Now, Susie, you had a point uh, to bring up while Greg was going there. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I guess, support and re-emphasize what Greg was saying about, you know, going from um, to, to the notion of we learn. Mm. And that hits onto the whole concept of collaboration, which is the space that we're in, 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 in our world today, and most definitely in the teaching and learning environment. My point there is that um, just as individuals, we, we communicate with one another and we are one amongst a, a, a billion human beings, the school as well is not responsible for a, the singular event of learning anymore. Mm. That The whole ecosystem has exploded. It's become global, if you will, or, and, and with that, open. And that goes, that goes to the point that David makes really clearly in his book, Open. So uh, wh where I'm going there is, is the ecosystem is not no longer controlled by, one, a school or uh, a relationship that is teacher, maybe principal, and, and, and th 30 students in a classroom. Mm -hmm. It's actually a partnership, a partnership that brings in the parents in ways that we haven't seen before across the whole globe. It brings in partners like, as Greg's mentioned, Telstra and, and Steelcase, etc. because we each have a role to play and we all have a responsibility to education. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just rest on the shoulders of yeah. departments of education. Mm -hmm. that, that's another myth to be posted. That's number five, that's number five. It's and also just employers, all the, the industry. Yeah, so just the uh, results of our poll, uh, it seems that it's a split between the digital literacy of the teachers uh, and the infrastructure challenges that people are facing. So mm -hmm. I want to get sort of into this. And I, uh, we've had a couple of people say, well, you know, schools are doing this. And yes, we agree. But it's like uh, workplaces as they're, as they're advancing. It's not quite um, uniform yet. But there's also no perfect solution. However, I, I'd say maybe there is no perfect solution yet, and it's not uniform yet. Um, yesterday we heard the, the term used... Um, Beautiful exceptions. Beautiful exceptions. Beautiful exceptions. And we all know about those because, you know, you run trials um, that are not repeatable. We, we've had experiences of those in education. But I have to say that what Greg's been leading at Delaney College um, through the Delaney Connective is actually not a beautiful exception. It is something that can be repeated, and they're repeating it within the school. Mm. So, I mean, I'm not going to steal your thunder here, Greg, but I just want to, to point out that that's a winner. It's a huge winner. People should go look at it. Um, we're going to talk about it more on, on, on Friday mm -hmm. anyway, so people will have an opportunity, teachers in fact, but um, maybe that's worth mentioning here because yeah. that goes to the notion of unif not uniformity so much, but diffusion. How do you, yeah. how do you, you know, tell those stories um, of truth uh, and, and capability that you can actually re repeat in other areas? Yeah. So down in the resources tab of, your, of the platform here, you can download a, a copy of the case study video for the Delaney School. And why don't we get into that a, a bit now? And also, one of the questions I'd have for you, Greg, is, is so where do you, I mean, start? Because it, it can become very overwhelming. Well, I want to start with Susie, because that's myth number six. There's no perfect solution. There, there will never be a perfect solution. 
this is an exercise in um, diversity because if you actually buy into learning theory, context connections and metacognition, by definition they have to be different. They have to have some recognisable base points, however. And that's perhaps the starting point with um, Delaney. Um, the, the work that went on specifically in Delaney, and again it's the sort of tip in the iceberg, everybody can see all this wonderful space and technology and people working um, in different ways. The starting point was a discussion of how do we meet the needs of the young people in our ever-changing, it's very rapidly changing environment, it's socio-economic status, it's the highest multicultural, it's got everything that you know, people say challenging. Um, uh, with a, a long history, but they had staff who realised that we need to do some, some things here. So for at least 12 months, there was a dialogue and discussion. And the power of what they did, and this is why I said the learning is the part of it and the learning theory is, they took national, state curriculum, the realities around that, in the sense of adjacent again, you can do that, and then they moulded what they call their learning world, which is an expression of a learning framework. So everything they do comes out of a deep understanding of learning and a commitment to collaborate together and share practice. They've committed to opening up their own practice. They're committed to reviewing their own practice, etc., etc. And then we're providing technologies that allow it to do them in real time, just in time, where they need it. We provide the opportunity not only to record and review, but to, re to, to stream live and then to record so that people can come back and teachers can come back. That's taken them into new ways of working. And coming to David's point, I couldn't agree more about the changing nature of the teaching. While we continue to find teaching in terms of hours taught and numbers of students, we're going to keep them, keep teachers working in the manual age, the industrial age, and we treat them like workers. They're no more than just labourers mm -hmm. in, in a coal mine. The only thing that's missing is the canary. If you take the, De the Delaney example, you've got genuine knowledge workers. They are taking teaching to that next level and showing what it means to be a knowledge worker. They are taking control of the time. They don't operate to a timetable. They have kids who won't leave the learning space to go and have meal breaks because they want to continue learning. All those things that have defined the way we go about organising teaching. But it all started with this issue of kids learning and, and what we know about good learning theory. And, um, and, and, and they've made that commitment. Our job then was to support them. We each played a part in that, our two partners in this, um, really understand that um, it's going to be a journey. It's not without its problems and we're continuously reviewing it. Can you transfer Delaney into our other 25 secondary schools? No. Because the issue here is, and this is what I want to really focus on, you learn the work by doing the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it means to be a knowledge worker. And nobody can do it for you. The minute you hand it over, and that's why we don't just put kids in front of computers, you are not being actually true to understand what good learning theory is. So take me through and I'm the intensely yeah. positive about our work, our, our teachers. They can do it because nobody else can do it. Yeah. I can't do it. David can't do it. Yep. Susie and Lise can't do it. And with all due respect to you, just like just me, you might be, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. It's the teachers there. So whichever way you look at it, you're forced back into this tight engagement with them and then opening up the world and capability and social media and all those sorts of things and giving them the challenge and giving them the stretch. However, the transferable guidelines would be something like mm, yeah. the good pedagogical framework that they have, oh, right? Definitely, Susan. And then, then the supporting elements that underpin yeah. that, like... And, uh, yeah, all those things, but what I'm saying is we have now thousands of hundreds of people coming through. They all want to run back and say, that's fantastic. Um, on Monday I'm going to start and do what they did. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. Mm. But I agree, if you get the core of the things that David's mm. been talking about, that's where you've got to start. Yeah. Yeah. One of these things is that, you know, like we've had 200 years of the traditional model of schooling, and it's taken time to be really deeply entrenched. We've had about, uh, well, at Delaney, we've had two years. Come and see it in 10 years. Come and see it in 20 years. Will it be the same? Well, I don't know. The one thing I know about the technologies, for example, is they're going to smaller and more powerful and more embedded. Artificial intelligence and augmented reality. It's going to take us to a new plane. Yeah. I would hope Delaney is going to be very different mm. then than it is in the 2030 iteration mm -hmm. than it is now. But that's going to be a growth cycle. That's what I mean about the transfer. Yeah, so Greg, I want to take you take us through the theories of action, um, your enablers particularly, and, and yes, what do okay. we do? Um, well, 
again, I say the simple proposition, we start with a simple proposition that all kids can learn and schools exist to improve learning. I mean, that's quite revolutionary if you think about <laughs> how most schools operate. You know, where attendance is compulsory and learning is optional. <laughs> that's what we have. In, that's a policy position in Australia and the UK. Yep. Imagine if it was learning was compulsory and attendance was optional. We might be able to do some really interesting things. So all kids can learn, not the bright ones, the stupid ones, the SES ones, whatever. How do they learn? We have good teachers teaching them. How do we have good teachers? We have teachers who learn about the craft, continue to improve, open, etc. use technologies and mm -hmm. those sort of things. How do we get good teachers teaching? We have school communities led by um, leaders who understand that the core businesses are improving each student's learning outcome. They need the teachers to do that. And they need the teachers to be professionally developed, refreshed. And we have some great examples of what's going on, changing practice. Then we have how do you get the good leads? We have to work with the leads. We have to teach the leads because they're the ones who lead the communities. As I said, I don't do that. Um, we need them to do that. And then ultimately, we call it how our system learns. And mm -hmm. we're learning how to do this differently. Uh, I don't have this grand blueprint of how I'm going to see the schools in 10 years' time. All I know is we're challenging them to answer and respond to the issues that David mm -hmm. continues yeah. to write and people like that and take them forward. So. We base everything on that theory of action. It allows us to build a strategy. We have a strategy around innovation. It's called Imagine, Create and Innovate. And that's at the heart of the work that's been going on uh, in places like Delaney and the other ones. So you've got to imagine, can it be different? Then you've got to, okay, well, it's one thing to imagine it, but, you know, create it. And then let's take it to the next level about the innovate. So we've got a framework that allows us to do that, which allows us to put in resources, allocation, etc. I don't want to turn this into a, a systems theory thing, but we do need to make sure that they can operate and they need some sort of framework. And it's a, and then it's an iterative process yeah, as well. Yeah, it's iterative. You keep learning from it and improving, and that's, yeah. you know, one of the, makes it complicated. The complexity is that it's, right. it's ever-changing, and the technology and space needs to be flexible enough mm -hmm. to evolve with those changes. That's right. And, and that gets to the enterprise yeah. ecosystem. I yeah. mean, this is, we need to facilitate the ability to learn whatever that looks like. Well, yes. talking about the technology, what people don't see under that tip of the iceberg, you see, Delaney, we're, we're working as a system, system learning. We're putting in enterprise capability across our system, mm. robust student information system, enterprise integration platforms. I know these sort of things sound very jargonistic, but plugging in fin FMS, financial management systems, that are taking all the work that used to be done by all the people in the schools that distracted them from learning, and mm -hmm. saying, we can do that so you can connect. So yeah. the ultimate dream is to walk in. It'll know you wherever you are in our system, whatever your device is, whether you yeah. choose your own device, bring your own device, buy your own device, borrow or steal it. Well, we're not quite steal Yeah, hopefully not. Uh, we have enough of that going on. But um, um, the, you need robust infrastructure. And that, again, leads us to places like Telstra. Who can deliver robust infrastructure of the type that we need? Now, if we're running a banking system, they have robust infrastructure. They have enterprise capability, so I can get my money out in George Street here or in Newland Batal. Yeah. That's the capabilities we need in schools, and that's where Steelcase and those companies that actually help us. You cannot operate in the business of schooling today in isolation. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing that we've learned about that, and David makes it very clear, you'll have no future. But I think Greg's uh, um, can it perhaps inadvertently gone to if. It's true that there's no silver bullet, but I think yeah. the closest that we've got to it is something that he's identified and Greg and I both are lucky that we can go around the world, we can look at some great schools and the one thing that they've got in common is a, a complete obsession about how learning works. Yeah. Yeah. And they have conversations which, are, which engage lots of people. In some great schools, how learning works is a closed conversation between mm -hmm. you know the senior leadership not even the teachers mm -hmm. the great schools talk about how learning works with their parents with their students with their staff with their communities um, and everything else kind of flows on from that yeah so uh, Greg Whitby thank you for that uh, you uh, check out on your screen right now you can see uh, Greg's business card and his beautiful Lego figure which is phenomenal I'm going to quiz you later on how to make one of those myself. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn this back to you in the audience and I have a question for you and that is um, have you implemented innovative learning spaces in your educational institutions? Uh, yes, we have successfully implemented. Uh, yes, we're in the process of implementing. Now we are considering Im implementation in the next 12 months or no, you, you've not considered it as yet but uh, you're, you're thinking about it. So, which would be a, a good place to be. So, um, 
we, we talked about the innovative space, and I think this is a point where I want to turn to you, Elise, and, and ask. I mean, there's no, as we've said, there's no civil growth, there's no perfect space. But what do we do that's going to be um, good in the short term? What can we do that's, that's going to turn our educational space into a better space? Well, at Steelcase, we actually think more about behaviors. So uh, we take in consideration, you know, an, an ideal experience. And to have an ideal experience, you need to balance technology integration and human interactions. And there needs to be a balance between the two. And then space and the furniture that occupies the space can either be an enabler or a barrier to that experience. So as we see you know, new pedagogies and more collaboration entering the classroom, the space needs to evolve with, with, with those new shifts. Mm -hmm. um, and it cannot be a barrier, meaning that if you want to have team breakouts, a collaboration in a lecture hall, the fixed setting will become a barrier. Mm -hmm. So we strive to have flexible solutions, um, solutions that actually move with the rhythm of the classroom that can do both more focused individual work but also collaboration. Um, that allows the instructor to, to communicate not only to the mass of students in the room during lecture, but also connect individually with each student or with the teams that the students are breaking out into. So it's really flexibility um, and balancing um, you know, the, how we can support the human interactions and the technology integration. Yeah. So uh, now Greg was not too controversial, um, and I want to make that clear. We didn't kick him out because he was too controversial. <laughs> Instead, we wanted to bring somebody who's working on the ground with the Delaney School, uh, and that is Mark Hopkins. He's the team lead for Catholic Education Office. Um, I, now, you're out there, and I've seen pictures of you working directly with the students, which is phenomenal. So, I mean, when these things are put in place, I mean, do they work as well as we would hope they do? Yes. And well, that was easy. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> and the great thing is that um, the questions of teacher and student agency that um, sounds like theory in practice it means that uh, reality actually changes in front of you mm -hmm. and then expectations that we all know according to research will help determine a lot of outcomes is immediately responsive to the change in what they really see and of course because a conversation at Delaney happened with partners um, technology and, um, and spatial design fluency it means it was constructed around learning so that the instant teachers and students are in that space, the reality of their interactions change, which means teachers who care passionately about kids learning, regardless of what baggage the kids might walk through, you know, the white noise that Greg talked about as distractor, that passion in the front of changed reality of interaction means they are suddenly responsive mm. to all the learning theory because it's real, it's immediate, and people who've taught in a school for years and years turn and say, I never knew that about the children. Mm -hmm. I never had that expectation. I haven't seen that before. Not that the other children aren't beautiful and aren't, we aren't passionate about them, but this is new. Yeah. And once you've got that experience, then the learning really becomes central. Yeah, and I want to make clear too that this isn't an end point. It's a constantly evolving process. And just when we think we have it perfect, we'll find the flaws and we'll see a, a new way to do things that might be better. Um, and and there, it, there should never be a point when you in the educational space are thinking, I got it. Well, we, <laughs> the great thing that we have is what that means in practice for us is as a so-called badge consultant from the administrative center, um, I might be walking through the playground and a year eight student might bounce up and say, I think Friday afternoons are working better with the changes we've made. What do you think? So suddenly you're having a discussion with a year eight student in Granville about whether or not the adjustments you've made with the staff are really working from their point of view and he feels validated and heard and his student voice he thinks is a definite part of that. Mm. And that I think is a slight difference to closed learning conversations between executives. So yeah. Yeah. I couldn't have planned for that. <laughs> no. That's perfect. Well we mentioned earlier that uh, the way the, the job market is changing that 50 percent of employees may be freelance. So how do we adapt our teaching methods to, uh, to appeal to that audience and help train them and get them ready for that experience. And I'll open that up to whomever. Well, I think that's... Uh, we, everything we've been talking about today has been about learning. Everything that politicians talk about is about teaching. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's an irony that we think that we can somehow get some top-down changes, you know. F and, and, and we've talked about the silver bullet, you know. For a while in the UK, we thought interactive whiteboards were going to be the solution to everything. And then we realised all that did was solidify the position of the teacher at the front of the class and the kids sitting behind. So we've, we've, we have to start thinking about how do, how do learners learn best 
when they're not in school. And I think if we follow the learners and adapt our teaching to, to the ways in which they're now learning when they don't have to, mm -hmm. then we'll make, we'll get to that position that Greg talked about before where, you know, kids are going to school because they love learning and not because it's compulsory. Yeah. So actually, that, I think that bounces back to you, Mark, is what do we do to, um, do you think that the students who have gone through this program um, are perhaps more, I don't want to say loyal, but that's something that we worry about as, as employers is, you know, are we going to have staff who buys in to our, our company and to our mission? Oh. So are we seeing that, are you seeing that help um, with this style of education? Yeah, I'll, I'll challenge the premise and say Please. that we're picking up on, on what Elise um, made explicit, which was that collaboration, communication might need to be taught with a global view. So we would suggest that the students are deeply immersed in co-constructing a curricula based around how I communicate, how I think, why and how. But they also have to do it about how empathetic mm. am I, empathic. Yeah. Uh, they have to think how curious and open to ideas. Um, how do I actually work in a team of people I don't like? So once you make that explicit about the learning in a flexible environment where they then construct, the question of loyalty becomes interesting. Do you want a passive end user of technology? Or do you want a student cohort who will interrogate whether the technology mm -hmm. is working for them? So in our mathematics, we have students who cannot really procedurally easily divide 15 by 2. But they can get really frustrated with a suite of software that aggregates with its algorithms their precise data so that the graphs no longer represent the story they're trying to tell. So if you can imagine that contradiction of challenging what has been provided to them by you know, the biggest company in the world because they now know the story they're trying to tell with mathematics is not represented in the automatic algorithms. They want it changed mm -hmm. now, so you better get your functionality working in that two-week Silicon Valley <laughs> cycle because these kids aren't loyal in the way they want, but they might just create a future. But they're still working very hard and they're working toward the mission of the business, but they may not be you know, just sitting there waiting for the gold watch after 30 years. They're not a passive worker with a robotic uh, production line. If we're working with these children well, they become the future of the company. It's an asset that might help mm -hmm. create mm -hmm. the diversity. It's mm. different. I agree. And in terms of the learner, there's actually two things happening here. Two things are awareness and behaviour. I'll just jump to behaviour first. And your example of the year eight boy bouncing up to you, talking about, you know, and, and feeling like he owned that decision around Friday afternoons, brilliant, you know, that he actually had the mm, wherewithal and felt he had the permission um, and was in control enough to become, you know, to come up and make that comment sort of is a line in the sand around behaviour, new behaviours that we're seeing in learners. So while the learner himself or herself may not have changed, the behaviour sets definitely mm. have. Therefore the expectations too. And then just in, in terms of awareness, what I've seen in some, perf in some great functioning schools is an awareness um, among learners who have been explicitly taught to go to a meta level of, of what am I doing in the room, right? Rather than Yes, I know that I'm learning maths in, you know, in 30 minutes time and it's going to be about algebra or whatever it might be. They're, they're able to articulate what they're learning, why they're learning it, how well they're achieving um, uh, whatever it is that they're learning and can then also turn to their parents or to a colleague, to a, another student and share that learning. So they're two elements that I think, you know, um, are aspects of learning models of the 21st century that we really didn't take a hold of, you know, last century or even say five or ten years ago. So I think they're new entrants. And just to your point, Justin, around, you know, what does that mean for the workforce? That's incredible because if you're talking about um, empowered people in your own workforce, in your company, in your startup, um, or as your friends, you want to make sure they've got great behaviours mm. and an awareness because who wants to be told what to do anymore? It's all about what you contribute, how you operate in a collective, how you operate within a collaborative group, yeah. and then you know, bring the best of what you, you can yeah. to. So we're running low on time, but I do want to get to one other question that, I, that came in, I think it's a very good one, and, and it's particularly for you, David, because you've been bouncing all over the globe. Are there any countries that you can point to that have models that we should be uh, interrogating in more detail? Uh, and, and what's coming up that you're seeing is, w that has a lot of potential? I think we've got a, um, 
find those solutions for ourselves. Yes, sure, it's great to, to look at countries, but there aren't, it isn't as though there's a kind of homogenous, you know, here's a system that mm -hmm. works really well. Uh, it, what I think, uh, even the, the, the so-called, you know, the stars of the PISA league tables are constant, if, if they want to um, stay relevant, they're constantly changing. So what we're seeing in Finland just recently is that they're abandoning the idea of, of subjects and they're, they're starting to teach themes. Um, uh, so so they, they're not accepting the fact that they've got something which is going well, because not least because the problem that Finland was getting was that, yes, they had great achievement, they had really low student engagement. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really talked about engagement, but for me it's the key to all of this. Because we talked about engagement in the workplace, Susie just mentioned it before, you know, the fact is we're moving from an old system to a new system. Mm -hmm. And the old system has 11% of employees around the world engaged in their work. Mm -hmm. That is a shocking statistic. Yeah. But if we're not careful, we, that, that um, disengagement also applies in, in schools. And what I see, well, Marx really eloquently described what happens when you bring a new way of working. If teachers can see that their students become more engaged, because you can't have deep learning without engagement, but if they can see that you, your students are going to be engaged more as a result of that innovation, then they're persuaded. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that w it lies at the heart of that. We all know that we've tended to go for achievement above and beyond engagement. For the future, we need engaged learners and we need engaged employees. Yeah. So we have a lot of good questions that have come in, and uh, I do want to get to all of these. So we'll respond via text, so if you feel free to stay on the platform or you can check it out on demand. But I do want to thank all of our guests here today. We have one last poll question for you there on the screen. I would expect learning analytics to provide real-time data on student engagement, collaboration, learning progression, and success error rate. So please uh, let us know there. And uh, with just a couple of minutes left, Susie, I turn to you. And we, you know, we've talked a little bit about connected learner and, and the various things that we can offer, but if, if people, it's ultimately a conversation that needs to be had. Yeah. So where do we start that conversation? Well, um, we've got lots of information around that that we can share with customers. So if um, in the survey that's uh, available for people, if they want to come in and have a look or have that conversation with us, please send in your details and um, we can get back to you. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be an overnight solution. It's not going to be no, a, here, this is, this is what you need to do. Because as we've discussed, it just is not going to happen that way. No, but we're happy to go on the journey. Absolutely. So uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for joining us here today. Uh, a good discussion and not nearly enough time for it. Um, but, but thank you all uh, here on the panel as well. Uh, David Price, Mark, Ho Mark Hopkins, Elise Velo, and Susie Segler-Peters. Uh, thank you all very much for joining me. If you want to get in contact with all of these people, you can find their contact information there in the Speaker Resources tab. Um, so that is going to do it for this Telstra virtual event. In just a moment, you will see a survey pop up. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, and if you'd like to give us feedback on anything, we would love to hear it from you. So thank you all for joining us here on this Telstra virtual event.